Welcome back, folks, to another edition of my WrestleRant video series where I give my in-depth analysis of all the pay-per-views that I watch in the WWE Network. Over the course of the next couple of weeks, I'll be reviewing every insomnia of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, including the 2010 event right here for you right now. So kicking off the show, we had a triple threat falls count anymore, submissions count anymore matchup for the United States Championship, pinning the event champion Daniel Bryan against The Miz and John Morrison. Now, I thought this was a very underrated match, and I can't for the life of me understand why they never brought back this stipulation. I love the stipulation. I have yet to review the Breaking Point pay-per-view from 09, but I love the Submissions Count Anywhere matchup they did between the Legacy and DX. I thought that was a great stipulation. They brought it back a year later for this matchup that was made only days before the pay-per-view. And keep in mind, from Night of Champions 2010 to Hell in a Cell 2010, there was only like a two-week difference, a two-week build. So a lot of these matches on this show were just kind of given away, really had no build-up or anything like that. But anyway, though, um, I really love this matchup. It was kind of a way to do the Daniel Bryan and Miz rematch without giving away Bryan versus Miz 2, which they only did one other time a couple of months later, and that was it. Um, but they threw John Morrison in the mix for no apparent reason, I guess because maybe he pinned the Miz or something. He was in a tag team match a couple of days earlier. Um, so I, I, they, they just threw him in there just for the hell of it, just to give him something to do. But I thought this was a great match, but they have yet to do a Falls Count Anywhere, or I'm sorry, a Submissions Count Anywhere match since. And the fact that it was a triple threat made it even better. I mean, on paper, it may not seem like the most intriguing matchup since The Miz. I mean, at the time, he didn't have the figure four leg lock. The Miz and John Morrison never really had any submissions. But they made the most of it. They incorporated some new moves in their moveset, in their repertoire. It was great. It was very entertaining. A great way to kick off the show. One of the many reasons why this show is my favorite Hell in a Cell event of all time. I mean, a, a pay-per-view, not match of all time. But, uh, I mean, that goes... I mean, that's kind of not really saying much because most of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-views sucked. But anyway, though... Um, I thought this was a great matchup. Daniel Bryan pulling out the victory, making the Miz tap out. Now, a lot of people, myself included, thought John Morrison's inclusion in this would lead to him being the one to get the submission loss so J the Miz didn't have to take another loss after being um, pinned by Daniel Bryan or tapping out to Daniel Bryan at Night of Champions. Because he was Mr. Money in the Bank at the time, so a lot of people thought he was going to be protected here by having Morrison take the loss instead. That was not the case, and I thought it might have led to Daniel Bryan versus John Morrison, a feud between them at some point, but that never really led into anything either. So the aftermath of this matchup was kind of lackluster, never really led into anything anyway. But it was a great matchup to kick off the show for what it was. Take away the, I mean, the, the pre-stuff was great. The stuff that happened before the matchup, you know, going into the show was great between Daniel Bryan and The Miz. I made that clear in my Net of Champions 2010 review. Cheap plug, if you haven't watched it, go back and check it out. But the aftermath was botched. But a great matchup to kick off the show, nevertheless. Daniel Bryan still the United States Champion. Up next for the WWE Championship. So unlike the 2009 show where we had three fucking Hell in a Cell matches for no apparent reason. I mean, all of them could have used a stipulation. Some of them maybe not. But um, on this show, thankfully, we only got two. Some of them we've only gotten one. But on this show, we got two. Um, and they were also spaced out. So they gave away the WWE title match very early in the show between Randy Orton and Sheamus. Now, Randy Orton and Sheamus are two of those competitors that have had a million matches over the last couple of years. And their, their matches, I mean, while solid and sometimes very good, have never really been anything exciting. This matchup, I thought, was the best matchup these two have ever had, and they haven't come close to topping it since. It was inside Hell in a Cell, and granted, it was no blood or anything like that. PG, people, get that through your head. We're not going to get any blood intentionally, unless someone accidentally starts bleeding, gets busted open, whatever. They're not going to purposely start incorporating blood because they can't. It's PG. Get that through your heads. It's not going to... I mean, a lot of people are saying, oh, it should... The ad, what ad, uh, blood would add to this matchup. Of course it would, but they're not going to do it. Just understand that. But rant aside, I thought this was a great matchup. Randy Orton and Sheamus, after a lackluster feud over the summer, had in, some kind of magic in this matchup when they had this great chemistry back and forth, a lot of great action between Orton and Sheamus, utilizing the cell very well, too. I mean, both of them kind of shoved each other into the cell. Sheamus was coming off, you know, taking out the great Kali on Monday Night Raw a week prior. Randy Orton was coming off punting Chris Jericho in the head, so both guys were riding a wave of momentum, respectively. And um, I thought this was a very, very good matchup. A lot of back-and-forth action, a lot of great chemistry. Like I said before, they just found some kind of magic on the show that they haven't been able to find since. And Randy Orton coming up, the, going over Sheamus, still your WWE champion, after a nasty RKO on the steel steps. Also, incor or, also incorporating, um, I think, a Signet Cane, some steel chairs and steel steps, like I said before. 
So they made this an all-out brawl between Randy Orton and Sheamus, which could have easily closed out the show. And I'm very sad it didn't because the ending of the show wasn't really all that great, and I'll get to that in a few minutes. But this was an excellent matchup between Randy Orton and Sheamus that I would absolutely um, suggest you go out of your way to watch. I thought it was great. So good stuff there. Randy Orton still your WWE champion. And like I said in my Night of Champions review, Randy Orton was as over as a motherfucker in the late final few months of 2010. I mean, seriously, go back and watch these shows. Randy Orton was so fucking over as a babyface. The fact that they ruined him when they uh, did the whole Christian thing, I mean, that wasn't his fault. They booked him to beat Christian in two days. That's when the internet fans, all wrestling fans for the most part, there is no fucking IWC anymore. Everyone's on the internet. I think that's stupid. Anyway, I'll try not to use that term as much as possible, the IWC, whatever, internet wrestling community. That's when people started to turn on him, when he beat Christian in two days for the World Heavyweight title. I said that in my Night of Champions review. I'll say that again right here. Um, but he was still over. I mean, this was two weeks removed from Night of Champions, so of course he's still going to be over, but it's just so mind-boggling to go back and watch him be so freaking over as a babyface, and so great as a babyface, too, and then he would go stale a couple of months later, when, like I said, when the whole Christian feud thing, and now he's stagnant now, but you go back in the show, this was like the peak of Randy Orton in late 2010, so great stuff. Um, up next, we had Del Rio coming out to cut a promo, t- talking about how he took out Christian, how he took out Rey Mysterio, um, Del Rio had just debuted about a couple of months before this, so he was still trying to find his legs as an act. He was getting over, you know, gradually as a heel, so a good promo from him, you know, a good appearance, his pay-per-view debut without having him wrestle. I had completely forgotten all about this promo until I saw it. I can't believe this happened. I think this was one of the first pay-per-views I ever watched live, um, I, like, via live stream and all that kind of shit. I don't remember it vividly, but I do remember parts of it. Um, but that happened, Edge came out to interrupt him, kind of foreshadowing, planting the seeds for their WrestleMania match and at WrestleMania 27 for the World Heavyweight title. Of course, at the time, WWE probably had no idea they're going to be doing that match at WrestleMania. No one knew up until, like, Del Rio won the Royal Rumble that they were probably going to do that match at WrestleMania. They they had no long-term plan going into WrestleMania 27. Let's just say that right now. I think we can all agree on that. One of the worst WrestleManias of all time. I think we can all agree on that one. But um, anyway, though, Edge comes out, who is kind of slowly starting to turn into a baby phase. It was not yet official. But um, he took on Jack Swagger from Raw. I mean, it was a Raw match. Or wait, was Jack... No, Jack Swagger was from SmackDown at the time, doing the whole Soaring Eagle thing. Edge was still on Raw at the time. I don't think he was... He was traded to SmackDown until, like, the next day, maybe, or eight days later, I can't remember exactly, because he was the team, he was a captain, team captain of Team SmackDown at Bracking Rights a couple of weeks later, um, but he was kind of slowly starting to turn into a babyface, they had nothing for him to do on Raw, so it only made sense for him to go to SmackDown, he was starting to get over in his war against stupidity, which I always thought was entertaining, that was what made me a big Edge fan, I was already an Edge fan before that, but the whole, um, you know, the whole war against stupidity, all that kind of stuff, I thought that was hilarious, it was a great thing for Edge to do. Going back to SmackDown, bring back the trench coat, the glasses. I thought it was awesome. So great stuff here from Ed, um, Edge. I mean, the match itself was really nothing notable. It was like a 10-minute matchup between Edge and Jack Swagger. It was kind of a boring matchup because people didn't really know how to perceive Edge. He was slowly getting over as a babyface, like I said before. But it was not yet official yet, so people didn't really know whether to cheer him or boo him or whatever. It was a matchup made at the last minute because Edge wasn't on the pay-per-view and neither was Jack Swagger, the former World Heavyweight Champion, which still pains me to say that. Um, but anyway, though, good matchup from Edge and Jack Swagger on the show. Nothing memorable, kind of boring, kind of flat because people didn't really have any incentive to cheer for either guy at the time. But um, either even, even still, I thought it was a good matchup from Edge and Jack Swagger. Up next, another one of the highlights of the night for me personally. Another match that we thought could have been inside the cell, but I'm glad it wasn't considering the fact that three fucking Hell in Cell matches in one night was a terrible idea. Um, much like it was in 09, but, um, so I'm glad it was only kept to two matches, but Wade Barrett versus John Cena, okay, the first ever one, or actually the second ever one-on-one meeting, if you count that match from Raw earlier that year, but anyway, that's being too technical. The stipulation of this matchup was that if John Cena won, the Nexus would be disbanded, they'd be done forever. If Wade Barrett won, John Cena would be forced to join the Nexus. So it was a very intriguing stipulation going into the show, and I thought, I personally thought, I don't know about anyone else, maybe people saw it coming, I thought John Cena was going to win. The Nexus was over. And I love the Nexus. I've made that very clear um, over the last couple of years. I made a whole freaking video about it a couple months ago about how the Nexus is my favorite stable of all time. Um, But even still, I I really, really thought that John Cena was going to win here. Put an end to the Nexus. That was it. But we get to the match. I mean, a great promo, by the way, going into this matchup. Go back and check it out for the promo alone. But um, the matchup itself, before we even get to the final outcome and what happened with all the interference and all that kind of stuff, the matchup was very, very good. Wade Barrett and John Cena have a lot of good chemistry together, uh, both on the mic, in the ring, all that kind of stuff. They're great opponents. They, they, they haven't had many matches. They had that 
This match, of course, their TLC matchup, which I was not really a fan of. Um, they had that one match on SmackDown, I think, in 2011. That was it. But um, and it, mind, it boggles my mind they haven't faced off more over the last couple of years. But even still, though, a very good matchup between Wade Barrett and John Cena. A lot of near falls. John Cena hitting the AA. Wade Barrett kicking out. Wade Barrett hitting the wasteland. John Cena kicking out. So a lot of good tension, a lot of emotion. Nat Stryker on commentary, who I thought was very underrated as a commentator. Kind of rooting for Wade Barrett to win just to see what it would look like in John Cena if he was wearing Nexus colors, the whole black and yellow shtick. So Matt Stryker, I thought, was very much added to this matchup. And fucking Michael Cole berating him and same thing with Jerry Lawler, making him feel bad with the entire matchup, which just kind of annoyed me. But um, anyway, though, Wade Barrett, John Cena, great matchup. We get to the finish. Interference from two... Faceless individuals. I mean, it would later be revealed to be Michael McGillicuddy and uh, Husky Harris, Curtis Axel and Husky or, uh, Bray Wyatt, of course, which is funny because Bray Wyatt would go on to face John Cena, would feud with John Cena a mere four years later. But anyway, though, um, that interference would cost John Cena the matchup, give Wade Barrett the victory. The crowd is stunned in silence, and much like after the Undertaker lost and they got you know the shots of all the people in the crowd being shocked. I mean, of course, this was not as shocking as the streak ending. Of course, nothing will ever beat that. But um, the shots of all the kids in the crowd, the, you know, the facial expressions of them being so surprised that John Cena lost and was being forced to join the Nexus were priceless. Great stuff there. Great stuff by the WWE camera crew. So good stuff. Wade Barrett, your victor. John Cena, a new member of the Nexus. And like we've said before, I mean, this was kind of, you know, a foregone conclusion. The aftermath of this feud, of this matchup, was terrible. John Cena joining the Nexus, but never really joining, never really turning heel. It was really botched. They botched the entire fucking feud for the next two, three months. I really was annoyed by that. But for what it was, the moment was awesome. The match was great. Um, Wade Barrett getting a very, a huge victory over John Cena on this show. So good stuff there. Um, so I really enjoyed this matchup. I thought it was a highlight of the show. Wade Barrett winning John Cena, now a part of Nexus. So we move forward from there to the Divas matchup, which of course was in the death slot right between that main event and the Hell in a Cell main event between Keen and Undertaker, so they really never had a chance. But it was Natalia versus Michelle McCool for the Unified Divas Championship, women's title, whatever you want to call it. This was right after the Unified the Titles at Night of Champions. Natalia was kind of slowly starting to break away from the Hart Dynasty. <clears throat> Tyson Kidd and David Hart Smith would kind of... Start to slowly tease tension and all that kind of stuff. And while that was happening, Natalia was teasing a singles run by herself, pursuing the Divas title, which is probably for the better, considering she is a great wrestler. She was, you know, slowly getting over on her own. So it was probably for the best that she started to break away from that act as they started to go down the shitter and um, started to pursue the Divas Championship. So a good matchup for what it was. Didn't even get five minutes of in-ring time before it ended in a fucking disqualification. One of the stupidest interferences of all time. Layla and I hated Lay Cool. I um, mean, I lay cool, say what you will about them, and them giving, like, maybe importance to the Divas Division. Everyone's opinion of lay cool was differs between who you talk to, but I hated the lay cool act. They were so freaking annoying. But Layla throwing her fucking shoe in the ring at, at Natalia, causing the disqualification, made no sense whatsoever. Um, Michelle McCool retains the title on the disqualification after Layla throws in her shoe. Made no sense. I thought this was a very dumb finish to what was an otherwise good matchup. They never really got the time. And it would prolong Natalia's uh, pursuit of the Divas Championship before she would go on to face Layla at bragging rights and the two of them in a handicap matchup at Survivor Series. So it really never got started. I don't blame either woman. They never really got any time whatsoever. The finish was dumb. So that was kind of a mess of a matchup. But anyway, at least the end game was there and Natalia winning that title. This was only the start of it, so I'm not really surprised by the outcome. But the way they did it was really, really stupid with Layla throwing in her boot of all things. It was so dumb. But we get to the main event between Kane and The Undertaker in a Hell in a Cell match, which was, you know, written for them, picture perfect, after, you know, Kane made his debut in the Hell in a Cell match 13 years prior, Bad Blood 1997, all that kind of stuff. So I had the story behind it. And this match was also over the World Heavyweight Championship. Now, of course, a couple of weeks before this, Paul Bearer made his long way to return to the WWE to side with The Undertaker. The match itself between Kane and Undertaker, the reason why I like their Night of Champions match so much was that it was a brawl. They were allowed to go all over the place. It was never really meant to be a wrestling matchup. A Hell in a Cell matchup really restricts you on where you can go in and outside of the cell and stuff like that. They stayed within the cell for this contest. It was not a good matchup. It wasn't very good at all. Um, I thought it was probably the worst of the three of the three matches on pay-per-view that Kane and Undertaker had. Which is a shame, because like I said before, the Hell in a Cell match was written for both these guys to kick off their to kill off their feud. Um, and they would go on and have a, bra or a Buried Alive match a couple of weeks later at Bragging Rights. 
But um, even still, though, not a very good matchup because it did force them to do more wrestling stuff. And at this point in their respective careers, they were not up to do that. Um, they were not up to par when it came to that kind of stuff. They needed a, a great opponent to work with, and to work with each other was not the best idea. But um, anyway, the finish was also very dumb, too. It was very illogical and very uh, storyline and kayfabe -ish and, you know, comic bookish and kind of all that kind of stuff. With Paul Bearer turning on The Undertaker by taking out the urn, blinding him with the urn, with the light of the urn, and having Kane capitalize and all that kind of stuff. That was really stupid. Um, Kane, uh, Paul Bearer turning heel, heel to side with Kane, helping him retain the World Heavyweight Championship. So I was glad Kane retained the title. Um, it was very unprecedented for him to beat The Undertaker two times in a row in big marquee matches. So I thought that was great. Um, and it set the stage for their Buried Alive match at... Not Survivor Series, bragging rights a couple of weeks later, which Undertaker would also lose, but I'll hopefully review that pay per view at some point as well. But anyway, though, um, like I said, a lackluster matchup. Did it belong in the main event? Probably not. They could have probably done Barrett versus Cena in the main event, but maybe they wanted to have the Hell in a Cell match in the main event because they w it was a Hell in a Cell pay per view after Raw. I mean, it makes sense. I could see why they did it. But um, just not the best match to kick off the show. But at least that was a shocker. I was shocked to see Paul Bearer go heel. There's that. Um, so that was it. But a very newsworthy addition, a very newsworthy Hell in a Cell pay-per-view with the heel turn of Paul Bearer joining the uh, joining the, the Demon Kane, um, the Devil's Favorite Demon Kane, the World Heavyweight Champion, and John Cena joining the Nexus, a very newsworthy moment as well. So like I said before, as a whole, I really, really enjoyed the show. It beats the hell out of almost all the Hell in a Cell pay-per-views, and easily my favorite one. I think maybe 2012 comes at a close second. But you'll get my thoughts on the rest of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-views in the weeks to come. But um, like I said before, a really good edition of Hell in a Cell. Matches you should go out of your way to see. Daniel Bryan the, versus Morrison the Miz, the triple threat submissions count anymore match of the U.S. title, I thought was a great opener. Definitely watched that. Very underrated in my opinion. Orton versus Sheamus, another awesome match. An unexpectedly great match between Orton and Sheamus inside the cell. Good stuff there. Barrett and Cena, another great matchup um, with John Cena joining the Nexus. Watch it for the facial expressions alone of the little kids after John Cena loses. They're priceless. Then you can also watch it for the heel turn of Paul Bearer. Maybe not more so the matchup, but the uh, the heel turn was you know a monumental moment, I guess, or a newsworthy moment, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, that finishes up my review of the 2010 installment of WWE Hell in a Cell. As a whole, I love this show. Glad of you to watch it. I would give it the two thumbs up, and I would suggest that you watch it on the WWE Network for only $9.99. Thanks for watching as always, folks. Always appreciate the support. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can find me there at Russell Rant. Find me on Facebook as well at Graham Jason Matthews. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Share as well with all your friends. Invite them over to the channel. I'll be, re I'll be reviewing uh, other installments of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view in weeks to come. As always, I'll be reviewing the 2011 installment of the WWE Hell in a Cell pay-per-view in a couple more days. As always, guys, thanks for watching. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch you guys soon.